everyone. So we today is uh, the second day of the third workshop uh, that has been organized jointly by Nano Harmony and NanoMet. Uh, I'm very glad to welcome you today. So for those of you that were here yesterday, so just to remind you, yesterday we went, uh, we had a, an update about the process, about different projects regarding test guidelines development. We had uh, the opportunity to have an exchange about the roles of the different stakeholders throughout the different phases uh, of uh, the development of test guidelines and guidance documents within the OECD. We also heard some more technical discussions regarding some projects on the way, uh, one on the steel batch reactor dissolution rates and solubility, which is led by Denmark. We heard also about uh, certified reference material from uh, Rob Cloud. And then we went also to hear about uh, a project, uh, go for nano on the work that they are doing uh, regarding the development and supporting the development of the guidelines. Uh, today, we're going to continue this morning with uh, the discussion. We're going to hear a little bit about uh, the work that RISCON is doing regarding test guidelines development. So if I if I um, capture this properly, this will be uh, the work that is done in phase zero. So before it comes to the OECD and before it is a project proposal. We will hear a little bit more about the, the Malta initiative. Yesterday, Thomas Kulbush presented this, but uh, Anke Jesse, who has been uh, the main uh, driver here, is going to present uh, the history about this, but also where do we want to head with it? So we were discussing yesterday about, about making the support to test guidelines development uh, more sustainable. Then we will hear from Elizabeth Yunish. Uh, she's going to give you an update about a recent uh, newsletter, if you want, that uh, that uh, condense all the pro the, pro uh, the work that has been done today. And then we will have uh, a presentation from Richard Handy. We will try to sum up this around uh, one o'clock, and then in the afternoon, we will be moving a little bit further uh, about what is, uh, how can we uh, learn a little bit more about uh, nanomaterials and what, how can we transfer this, uh, these lessons learned for advanced materials. And we will hear uh, this afternoon a couple of presenters coming more from um, a standardization organizations. We will hear from Lars Montelieu about the Materials 2030 initiative, which if I'm not mistaken, is also having a, a workshop today. And then uh, we will hear about uh, the work that has been done within the OECD. And with that, I will uh, then we will conclude with some uh, sum up uh, from the discussion from today. Uh, just before we move forward, just uh, wish uh, to ask the presenters just to keep in the time allowed so we can have uh, a couple of questions at the end. If you need uh, to ask questions, please use the chat at any moment. I will be monitoring this. Uh, speakers will be able to respond uh, in writing through the chat. But uh, in any case, as uh, Sean already mentioned, if there's anything uh, a little bit more elaborate that you need uh, to ask, please feel free to, um, to raise your hand and we will give you the floor. So today, uh, just... This is going to be the agenda. Uh, we're going to start with ISEO Lynch and with the work on uh, the risk on project on the test guidelines development. So with that, ISEO, uh, if you agree, I will give you just uh, the handover so you can share your screen. Perfect. Thank you very much. And I will hopefully share slides. And are you seeing those OK? It's perfect. Thank you. Super, thank you very much. So thank you very much for the opportunity to present the, the update on the risk on activities towards test guidelines development. And I am presenting it on behalf of Maria Dushinska, who is on it, who had intended to present, but actually ended up having to be in the skies flying as we speak. And um, so I will do my best to, uh, to replace Maria this morning, this afternoon, depending on where we are. Um, okay, so just very quickly then, uh, the objectives of RISC-ON were to and are to contribute to the standardization and validation um, and to help with optimization and pre-validation of standard operating procedures. 
with the goal then of leading to specific test guidelines and guidance documents for integration into the uh, risk governance framework. Um, we also then have some broader goals around the risk on database and the cloud platform and integrating all of our findings into some decision support tools and everything that we develop within risk on is supplemented by training materials and training videos. And really the overall goal is to feed the science more effectively into um, regulation and to, to help with communication between stakeholders um, to allow us to have better governance of, of engineered nanomaterials. Um, I won't spend time on this, but just to say that we have, um, as all EU funded projects, we have a range of work packages, um, several of which were devoted to risk governance and risk benefit ana analysis. Um, and then the three main ones that I will be focusing on today are the technical ones. So we have work package four on characterization, dosimetry and environmental fate, work package five on hazard assessment and work package six on ecotoxic ecological assessment. And work packages five and six were intentionally structured in a very similar way, doing very similar things, but just coming at it from a human health and uh, an environmental health perspective. Um, and then we have, um, yeah, obviously the, the activities around management and communication. Oh, sorry. Um, so a lot of the work that we've been doing is developing a, a risk governance framework, and that includes things like our decision trees, but also then the draft guidelines that we're planning to develop. Um, and within our description of action, we had said we would work on eight draft guidelines and 12 uh, technical guidances. So we were quite ambitious in our, in our intentions. So we had indicated that we would work on six activities related to characterization, fate and dosimetry, and three SOPs related to both human hazard and environmental hazard assessment. And that all of this would then be integrated together into our risk governance and our risk on cloud platform. Um, so working through then the, um, the experimental work packages, in each of them, we have a plan of um, what we're going to do in terms of uh, developing standardization and validation processes, um, working through a harmonization approach, and then using interlaboratory comparisons or round robins uh, to standardize and pre validate the methods. Uh, work package four on the FISCHEM activities is led by LIST, work package five by uh, Swansea University, and work package six on EcoTox by myself. Uh, Birmingham. Um, and for each of those, we have a plan of uh, a set of materials that were used in our first round robins, a set of different materials that were used in the second set of round robins, and then based on that um, data set, then moving towards um, updating of existing test guidelines or development of new test guidelines. Um, so within Work Package 4, our ambition was to deliver at least six pre-validated draft guideline documents um, covering all aspects of characterization, transformation, fate and dosimetry, which included also the dispersibility and assessment of surface charge, endotoxins, uh, hydrodynamic diameters and distributions, and that was to be also in the biological media that we were using for the toxicity testing in Work Package 5 and for the ecotox testing in Work Package 6. So really trying to keep that loop aligned where we have the, the characterization data and the, the updated um, characterization protocols aligned with the toxicity assessments in Work Packages 5 and 6. Um, so again, um, two rounds of, of round robins have been completed on two different sets of materials. Um, all of the SOPs for those have been harmonized and tested. Um, a key part of all of what we were doing was working with um, the what we call it the template wizard to develop the data capture templates. And that includes also some of the metadata associated with the assays so that we have all of that documented and um, made as, as fair as we can. Uh, there is a third round robin ongoing currently, and for all of our um, work packages, there's training materials being developed. And as I'll show you now in just a minute, there have been numerous contributions also into ongoing activities in NanoHarmony. Um, so among the methods that we've been working on in work package four um, and updating of the activities, um, 
we have looked at both powders and dispersions, and these are the, the materials, and you'll, you'll recognize they all have the, the JRC identifiers associated with them, as well as um, this is the, the European Materials Registry numbers that we've also um, listed as a way of, of allowing us to, to enhance the harmonization of data sets. Um, so we've been doing quite a lot on the nanomaterials dispersion, looking at the impact of, of vortexing and, and other uh, dispersion methods, linking that through then to um, optimized endpoints for characterization. So including particle size, zeta potential and the pole dispersity index, and then also integrating that with the, um, the endotoxin test, the LAL test. Um, then we've also been doing quite a bit of work on, um, so specifically then how all of that links through into the OECD test guidelines. So working um, as part of the, the activities on dispersion stability of, of nanomaterials in simulated environmental media. So that's TG318. Um, we've been making contributions there. Uh, also involved in the activities on hydrolysis as a function of pH. So test guideline 111 and adsorption, desorption of surface coatings and things in TG106. Um, also then working on adaption of existing methods. So looking at effective density and deposition of nanomaterials using volumetric centrifugation methods. So again, building on work that has been previously published, further optimizing it, developing the, the SOP, and then round robin testing that within the work package for partners. Um, all of those are now being documented and a number of them have been put forward um, as SPSFs as well. So hopefully we'll be taken up for future activity in, in the, the current round of evaluations. Um, into work package five then on human hazard assessment. Again, as I said, here the goal was to, to look at uh, and develop three pre-validated draft guidance documents. And again, looking at both innovative in vitro me me models. So this is the, um, the, for example, the 3D spheroids and the, the tetraculture air lung interface model, um, but also then looking at high throughput and high content assays. So really trying to, to increase the throughput of what's been possible. Um, and the work package overall had a really strong focus also on development of adverse outcome pathways for nanomaterials. And these were the test guidelines that we had identified initially. So several related to genotoxicity and obviously a, a very strong push within um, risk on to develop a, a, a comet assay um, guidance document and, and test guideline, um, but also then looking at uh, cell transformation and cytotoxicity assays, including the, the colony forming efficiency assay, which I'll talk a little bit more about, and which is one that um, we're very keen to, to take forward. So again, all the round robins in, of the first round materials have been finished, and the second round materials are well underway. Um, there's been a, a, a report on the adverse outcome pathways that was finalized, and ongoing activities and contributions to, to Malta and to training materials. So just to give a little bit more detail then from the Work Package 5 perspective, um, really the, the objectives were to evaluate and adapt in vitro human assays, really to focus then on evaluation and adoption of high throughput and high content assays, and a strong focus on interference-free assays, because as we know, nanomaterials have a lot of potential interferences due to the, the high surface area and the fact that a lot of the indicator dyes used in colorimetric and fluorometric assays can interact with the nanoparticle. Um, also then looking to adapt um, and evaluate novel uh, mechanism-based in vitro tests and the, and the test system. So again, looking at test systems that were developed in previous projects, such as patrols or um, existing models of, of LIST, for example, um, and seeing which of those can really be made um, harmonized and, and more standardized. And again, evaluation and verification of, of AOPs. Um, and this was all the, the all of the tools and the data generated will feed back into the risk assessment uh, framework and the risk governance framework. Um, in terms of task 5.1, the experimental work on the, for the Comet assay and the HPRT have been finalized um, and statistical 
analysis was undertaken by QSAR labs. The second round of uh, round robins, which used uh, copper oxide, tungsten carbide, and uh, uh, multi-walled carbon nanotubes um, is also underway. Uh, the, the experimental work is finished and the reporting is being finalized. And the publication plans have been, uh, sorry, that should be, yeah ongoing through uh, to 2022 uh, papers on each of the, the specific assays that have been looked at. And I'll talk a little bit more about the colony formation assay and the impedance one in a second. Um, in terms of task 5.2 on the high throughput screening and the high content analysis, here the goal was really to do first a literature analysis, looking at a range of cytotoxicity and genotoxicity endpoints, and the criteria used in searching the literature were reliability, and again, this strong focus on the potential for nanomaterials interference, but also then looking at robustness, cost and time efficiency, and eco-friendliness in terms of the reagents and, and um, solvents and things needed. And um, again, looking at common nanomaterials, cell lines, exposure conditions, and protocols. Um, the challenge that they had with this was that actually, despite the amount of literature, only nine papers passed the, the Guide Nano and Toxor Tools set of testing um, quality criteria that were used. So they had to revise the initial plan as they weren't able to then to select assays or endpoints from the literature to perform the round robins. Um, so what they did then instead was had QSAR Lab and IDEA consult, ran some analysis and basically chose um, to look at and to, to focus the, the round robin activity on reproducibility itself. So they took the task 5.1 uh, assays that had already been round robin tested and then they've only needed to do one additional one, which was on the impedance based testing. And again, because the, the instrumentation for that is not as widely available within the, the consortium, the way they got around it was by transporting the, the Exelligence instrument from uh, University of Bergen to Nilu, and they tested three particles again, and these particles were common with nanoreg. So by doing that, then they were able to include three lab uh, data from three separate labs. And that is now um, being integrated uh, to show the, the reproducibility of the method. Um, and uh, University of Bergen are working a lot and in consultation with the, um, the national contact points and things for, for the OECD in Norway to, to see what the next steps are. Um, and now within work pack five, task 5.2, the key activity is on uh, papers on, writing up the papers on the nanomaterials interference with nanotoxicity testing methods, and particularly on the high throughput screening and high content analysis methods. Um, within task 5.3, uh, where they were testing again, the relevant assays, so they were using, again, looking at all of the data that's available in the literature and from within previous projects, such as controls. They looked at advanced co-culture models, including human skin, liver, lung, GI tract, brain, and the lab on a chip activities, performed a literature review and selected which methods were to be used. And now the round robin is currently underway on the, the two most robust methods that they selected. And these were the patrols 3D liver spheroid model and the list tetraculture air lung interface model. So those round robin trials are underway currently and will be documented shortly. Um, and then the last piece of the activity is pulling it all together. Um, in terms of development of training materials. So the training materials for each of the methods, each of the, the round robins, um, including the, the refined and modified standard operating procedures and lab-based training. And all of these are being put together uh, and available through both the YouTube and, and Vimeo platforms. And um, just very briefly on the colony forming assay, um, the, the goal with this one is to look at the percentage of cells inoculated at low density that give rise to colonies and it's an interference free assay which is why we've been promoting it quite a bit and suitable both for chemicals and particles and it can also be used to compare the, the colony size so you can look all
like growth in innovation or growth facilitation or promotion. Um, this is just a, a summary of how it looks. Um, the method is, yeah, I won't, I won't go into details, but really just um, plating it up, um, staining, and then um, you let it sit for approximately 10 days to form the colonies, then stain them, remove the staining, and count the colonies, and they look pretty much like this. Um, so in terms of counting, then, you know, they look at at least 50 cells per colony and there should be visible by the eye and um, some are quite close to each other. And then it's a uh, comparison of the relative um, amounts. We're also doing some work to look and see, can we, um, can we automate and can we use imaging based um, machine learning approaches to, to quantify these more effectively to, to reduce uh, human error and bias. And again, just very briefly, these have um, the round robins have been done and the results were uh, pretty comparable and looking to understand where small deviations arose to further refine the, the SOP. And then the, the round robin with the next set of materials is underway to really assess the, um, the transferability and the applicability across a wide set of materials. Um, one of the other assays that we're promoting quite strongly within risk on and really working to, to develop it to the point where we can submit a, an SPSF is the bioimpedance testing using um, Excelligence. And this is, has numerous advantages in that it's label free, it's real time, it's high throughput, and it's pretty eco-friendly. Um, and it measures how cells impede electric current flow. And we can assess with it viability, proliferation, and the, the mechanism or the mode of cell death. Um, and again, this is what it looks like. Um, and again, um, quite, quite reproducible. And a lot of information can be derived from the curves and the shape of the curves as well. Um, and that method is, is one of the things we're really trying to show with it is that it's applicable both in human talks and also in, in eco talks. Um, so as I said, work package five and six have a very similar structure. So I can run quite quickly through what we're doing in work package six as well. And again, our goal was to deliver sort of three pre-validated draft guidance documents and focusing on here in, in innovative in vitro models and mechanistically relevant high throughput assays as well. Um, but we have a strong focus on, on Daphne and Magna. So a lot of the work that I'll talk about is based on updating at TG211, for example, to, um, to look at um, reproduction in, in Daphne. And we're working as well to, to integrate that into an, an adverse outcome pathway for impacts of nanomaterials on, on Daphne. Um, so again, we have a number of different assays that we're working on and quite a lot of collaboration, both with NanoSolvit and with NanoCommons in terms of the activities. Um, also here, we're very interested in the um, impedance approaches and, and um, interference free ones. And here, um, University of Bergen have been working also to look at the impact of and the behavior of uh, fish cells. And these are fish gut cells, but we've also done it with fish gill cells um, in an electric field. And what they're finding that, that's really quite interesting is that at low frequency, the cell membrane is a significant barrier to flow. And that gives us information about the cell size. At intermediate frequencies, we get a lot more information about the membrane properties. So um, how easy or, or not it is to cause membrane damage. And then at high frequencies, we get information about things that cross through into the membrane uh, or through the membrane, and then we can get information about the cell interior. And this has been reported and is now being um, tested, as we said, through, through round robin approaches. Um, so again, that's just what it looks like and what the data look like. And then um, that is all interpreted to allow us then to get those insights into size, uh, permeability and interior of the cell. Um, so there is a meet, uh, Nilu and University of Bergen have a meeting, I think next week with the, um, the, the Norwegian um, representative, representative to the WPMN. So they will then discuss what, what further steps are needed. Um, and in the last couple of minutes that I have before I will stop for questions, I will talk just a little bit about the work that we're doing um, and that we've been doing within uh, Risk on Work Package 6 on proposed updates to 211 uh, to the Daphne reproduction test. 
So this test is, is typically 21 days and it looks at the total number of living offspring produced per Daphnia parent, um, which didn't die accidentally during the test. And then it looks at the total number of living offspring per surviving parent, and it has all sorts of things that we record. So daily counting of the offspring, daily parent mortality, and um, plus all the environmental parameters to check that the, the conditions have been um, stable through the through the exposure. Um, and again, checking for nanomaterials interferences there is important. And then other things that can be reported are, for example, if we have induction of males, which is one of the, the major signs of stress within Daphnia, because they normally produce parthenogenically female to female. Um, so among the work that we've been doing is suggesting a little bit um, some fairly simple things that could be done to, to adapt the test, and then maybe some more comprehensive things that could be done specifically for nanomaterials and or to give additional um, potentially mechanistic insights, because if you're doing a 21 day test, it's quite a big undertaking. So the more information that we can get out of it, um, the better it would be. So one of the things we found in a, in a typical exposure, you're measuring over the 21 days, as I said, from when you, you first get your neonates at less than 24 hours old, we look at the time to the first brood, the time to the second brood, and so on. And what we found with a lot of the nanomaterials is that we see delays in the induction of the brood. So they the definitely develop a little bit slower, uh, we think that's related to, to feeding, so we think the nanoparticles are accumulating in their gut, therefore they're feeding a bit less effectively or taking up less nutrients, so therefore they're growing more slowly, and that then has effects on when the broods are coming through. So one simple proposal is that, you know, we might need to extend out the duration of it if we're interested in getting the total, you know, for if, if getting to fifth brood is, is particularly important. Um, we've also then looked at things like freshly dispersed nanomaterials versus nanomaterials that have been aged in the medium, and that makes a huge difference. We know that because you know the, the, the freshly dispersed particles um, are much more reactive than ones that have been in the medium. So again, perhaps we're, we're overestimating toxicity if we just put them straight in. We've also looked, so there's a, a lot of diversity in, in the use of natural organic matter or other um, environmental components. So one of the ways we've been proposing to, to harmonize that is to use the, the, the Daphne themselves to, to filter through the medium and therefore to secrete biomolecules into it to condition the medium and then to disperse the particles in that medium and allow them to be taken up. And that gives a lot more control and a lot more reproducibility. And then potentially also to add some additional endpoints so we could add comet assay for genotoxicity and of course then to look at induction of males and if we do get males then to look at, at mating success. Um, in terms of specific nanomaterials things, um, we're also suggesting that we could add some additional characterization. So, for example, looking to see um, particles accumulating in the Daphne gut and potential damage to the Daphne gut. Uh, so proposing some TEM analysis and or some ICPMS analysis of particle loadings. Um, and then, of course, it's very easy to just take some images of the Daphne and look at, for example, phenotypic changes. So quantification of the lipid deposits which you can see here, for example, or loss of tail length, which is typically associated with aging of the Daphnia. And in many cases, we've seen quite accelerated tail loss of the Daphnia. So again, we can uh, just take these images and we've, we've developed a machine learning model already that can take these images and, and make some predictions of toxicity uh, just from these quite simple images. Um, and this one, I think, is, is maybe pushing the, the, the pushing out the boat a little bit too much perhaps, but we've also suggested that we might want to include additional generations. So in our work, we've done a lot of um, work, both looking at continued exposure and how that um, relates to then the fitness of the, the various broods of offspring. And then we've done paired exposure or where they're continuously exposed or recovery where only the parent is exposed and then the neonates are removed within 24 hours. And then we look at the following generations. And what we found is that there's a lot of change. So uh, a lot of change in the genetic signatures and the epigenetics. And we've also found that there's 
even if there wasn't that much effect in the F0 parent generation, we often see population decline or reduced breeding success in the second or third generations. So really just looking to see, um, you know, if our single assay of one generation is enough to really be predictive of population level effects. Um, I'm going to just wrap up really quickly. So one of the other things that we've been doing is trying to, to, to lay out all of the conditions that need to be reported and how we would capture all of that data and metadata and part of the quality assurance data and how we capture also the running cultures and all of the background information that's needed to really increase the quality of the publications that we're putting out and therefore the, the regulatory relevance of all of our, um, our assays. And one of the, the approaches that we're using to, to help us design those templates is this idea of the instance map where you can see based on color these are all the environmental parameters these are the um the biological assay parameters so uh, the things about the, the daphne of fitness itself and then the nanomaterial characteristics are recorded as well and um, so yeah just in conclusion on daphne there's uh, a lot of key missing information on mechanisms and given the effort involved in chronic studies that's a bit of a shame um, and to facilitate grouping read across and predictive models we should move um yeah to try and extend these um, we had hoped that we would be at a point to submit the SPSF for this in this last round, but we didn't quite get there, so we'll do some additional round robin testing within um, within the last period of risk on and aim to have this ready for the for the next one. And I see Mar has turned her camera on, which is indicating that I should stop. But then I was just going to say there are lots of um, other activities that we've been contributing to um, that are in the slides, but I can, um, yeah, maybe just to say we're involved in the updating of 201, 202 and 203, for example, and um, also with TG442 and lots of other things. So there are lots of, of in addition to the, the activities we're developing ourselves, there's also a lot of, of other things within Nano Harmony and within Malta project that we've been contributing to. Um, and I think I can stop there. That's just really just reiterating all of the, the activities that we've been involved in. And thank you very much for the opportunity to present it. And I'm happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Isel. And and and, uh, and and again, yesterday we were thinking. I mean, the, one of the discussion was how this uh, new test guidelines come up to the OECD. And I think this is an, an uh, this is the example. And and this is also the example about how much resources are needed, how much the science needs to be developed, needs to mature, need to be ready in order to bring it forward to the OECD. In exactly. terms of deadlines for the SPSF, I know that we have very strict deadlines. Do not worry, because I know that the work that is continuing, that, that you will continue doing, whether you do it within the WNT uh, process or before, it's just uh, time gain. So, so that's not a, yeah. it's not an issue. Exactly, and, exactly. Yeah. And, and I and think having the deadlines so helps us to focus our mind. And even if we don't get all the way, at least we get part of the way. And then we make a roadmap for what we need to have ready for next year. So, yes. Yeah. And, and, and just again, I mean, I think we have, uh, I mean, it's, 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 it's linked to the question that the Rachel was asking about uh, whether you have been interacting with your uh, national coordinators during the project and how useful it has been in facilitating the flow with the OECD. I think you, you have been connected to the OECD national coordinators, a yes. specific project yeah. expert group. So if you can just uh, give your views on this. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So I think part of, yeah, part of us getting to the point where we're trying to document these into SPSFs has really been valuable because that then requires us to have those conversations in a much more focused way and you know the fact that we're having them with multiple countries so um and you know i think that's part of the the beauty of us having done round robins is that we have several countries who have been invested in the activity so then we're having those conversations you know with norway with uh with luxembourg and um, in the uk and with with you know through through the collaboration on other ones we're also able to reach out to to, to Germany, to France, to, to, to Spain and, and other countries. So um, it is really useful and the feedback we get and the experience of you know what's what's useful to include in an SPSF versus you know what's going to be maybe 
not not of that relevance or too much of a leap from what's currently done to what we're proposing. Um, so I think that feedback is is really useful. Um, yeah, yeah. And and then thank you so much, Isabel. I have another comment also from Teresa Fernandez that you know very well also. Yes. Um, yes. That of course she's enjoying very much uh, to see the studies, but she was wonder um, uh, how much of this can be translated into regulatory testing and how much is research and and to try to understand the to understand what can be uh, translated into regulatory um, an endpoint. So I think it's it's about as she mentioned about uh, the need to consider cost benefits in a regulatory context and check how how onerous uh, this might be. So, but again, all the information uh, there is uh, there is a need to 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 make that publicly available because it's it's, it's so valuable. Yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. I I fully agree that, and I think that's part of the the value of the 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 national contact points and you know and the the OECD as well to to give that sort of guidance that yes, in an ideal world we would want everything, but what's actually feasible and realistic to do. Um, some of them, I think, you know, so I, I think where where the guidance will come in and, and the feedback will be really important is how we really effectively link what we want, say, in terms of characterization, you know, and, and dispersion protocols. If some of that is anyway updated in the dispersion protocols, then it it would almost become the default that we have to have our particles dispersed in a relevant medium. And if that relevant medium is, for example, the, the Daphnia conditioned medium or something else, then, you know, as long as we're having that connectivity and those conversations, I think um, that's helpful. In terms of the time investment in doing a 21 day study and extending it to, to 28 or extending it another generation, I fully agree that's, you know, it's a huge time commitment, but at the same time, what we're trying to do, and this is again at the research stage currently, but this idea of the, the phylogenomics where, you know, if we can really demonstrate that a lot of the key pathways triggered in Daphnia are the same pathways that are triggered in fish, potentially then, you know, a multi-generation Daphnia study could in due course replace a multi-generation fish study, for example. So um, that's sort of the thinking. And, and I, But I do agree that cost-benefit analysis is really critical and, you know, experience of, of maybe the, the, the research, the contract research organizations who do these assays at scale and, you know, for industry would be really valuable insight there as well. Thank you so much, Isolt. And, and again, it's uh, fascinating to see how much work you're doing. And uh, but uh, don't hesitate. I mean, if I mean, and now that you have another year to 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 mature the ideas, I mean, just to think about uh, like a webinar or something with the experts that are already involved in the different uh, yes. DAS guidelines yeah. on Ecotox, for example, that they can give you some uh, preliminary views and, and ideas. Yes. So just to yeah. brainstorm something less official, but uh, more about uh, direction. So, so yeah. feel free. That would be amazing. Yeah. Thank well, you. thank you. Thank you so much, Isel. So now um, for... I'm going to turn I'm it over to... Sharing. Thank you, Anke Jess, and I think it's going to be Sean who's be sharing the screen for her. Anke is going to uh, present the Malta initiative. She's going to present what has been done so far, which is a lot. But uh, we would also like to discuss with you what can, uh, what are the future steps. So, Anke, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ma, and hello to everyone. Um, now we skip a little bit to a broader approach to make you aware why you are doing all this wonderful work and uh, why you experts are all here. Next slide, please. I would like to remind you uh, that I speak as the chair of the Malta Initiative. I work in the Federal Ministry for the Environment, Nature Conservation and Nuclear Safety and Consumer Production, but Today, I speak as the chair of the Malta Initiative. Uh, otherwise, I had to make an inter-service consultation with other ministries with the slides. And I think uh, that this would take too much time and I couldn't be here. So please be aware all what I say is as a chair of the Malta Initiative. 
Here you see, no, please, um, the, the slide before, there was the skip of one slide, please. This is my structure, uh, just to see how broad is my approach. Next slide, please. So I would like to remind you that we are all act in a global market. And therefore, we need research for sustainable innovation and legal requirements, if there are any. Research must be comparable and reproducible, therefore. And we have this international standards we, we need, e.g. ISO, OECD, and what I always want to mention is the important role of metro metrology. Sorry, this word is very difficult for me. Otherwise, uh, you, you know it. I focus on the OECD test guidelines here, which are internationally harmonized. And the advantage of using OECD, OECD test guidelines and the other pillar, the good laboratory pra practice, is the mutual acceptance of data for OECD member countries. Next slide, please. Here you see the mutual acceptance of data principle. I think a lot of you are aware of this, but I think it's really important to remember this principle because we act in a global market and we have trade barriers and the mutual acceptance of data is legally binding OECD member countries. And this is one of the part of breaking down and reducing trade barriers. Next slide, please. So the advantages of the OECD chemical program is that this international cooperation is really unique. And a lot of people are not aware of the importance of this work. I meet every week, I meet two or three people who are not aware of this important work. And we have to repeat again and again, and another one again, uh, how important the OECD work is. So the OECD work, and they work on the basis of consensus. This is also very, very important. And I already mentioned it, the OECD test guidance and the GLP lead to mutual acceptance of data, the MAP principle. And another advantage is that Everyone has free access to the OECD documents. This is a value which is also very important to mention. Next slide, please. You already know that the OECD has established around 150 test guidelines. And the challenging task for the expert is adoption to technical progress. Then I know, uh, the, the multi-initiative started with nanomaterials, but you all know this is not only the focus, we also have to focus on test guidelines in total. And the next challenge and the next steps is the new approach methods, but we start with the nanomaterials. Next slide, please. In this picture, I would like to show you the bridge between the OECD, the OECD test guidelines and the EU regulation. REACH is one of the most important regulation in Europe regards to substances. And all the test has to do, has to made with um, the tests which are mentioned in the test method regulation 
of course you can do it in another way to be uh, legally uh, precise but they are based namely on the OECD test guidelines and therefore you see the important bridge between the OECD work and EU regulation and this is not only important for the people in uh, Europe, please next slide, but also important for people who want to bring goods, substances to Europe and responsible for the dossiers and to fulfill all the requirements of the EU regulation are the manufacturers and importers. And back to my beginning, we all act in the global market and we are connected together and we are dependent on each other. What we saw in the crisis the last years, very, very uh, strongly. Next slide, please. So now I come to the Malta Initiative. What is the Malta Initiative? The Malta Initiative was, I say, created during the European Council presidency in Malta. And um, I went to the DG RTD and um, described the situation with the reach regulation and the new requirements uh, with nanomaterials within reach. And I described um, the wonderful and important work at the OECD and the background that this work is voluntarily. And we have a lot of experts which have, uh, who have the knowledge uh, to do the work, but they need, um, they need uh, to be funded, to be financed. So um, I think this was uh, the time where um, the Malta Initiative was created. And uh, to give uh, this network um, a name, I proposed Malta Initiative. You can call it Test Method Initiative, but I think Malta Initiative was a little bit more funny. That's the reason behind. The Malta Initiative, and this is also important to know, is a network of international experts. It's not a superwoman, it's not a superman who is doing the work. The work is done by the experts in the courts or in other um, contracts. Uh, for example, in Germany, we, we uh, collaborate with the Uber and BFR and Bauer with our agencies and they do also do the work which is funded by um, our ministry, but the Malta Initiative is a network of international experts. They work on a voluntary basis and we have no official mandate. Please don't mix it up. Um, I have a special background because I focus and I underline this. We have no official mandate and we are not responsible that the work is done. We are a network and we address the importance of the internationally harmonized and standardized testing and measurement methods. As I already told you, we have sisters and brothers in our work, which is ISO and also the work of uh, metrology. Uh, I don't want to forget this, but I come back. The multi initiative focuses on OECD test guidelines. Next slide, please. This is, um, in principle, a picture of how we work. Again, we are in a network, no mandate, work on voluntary basis, and important um, partners, uh, discussion and sparing partners are ECHA, um, research projects, international partners, uh, the Commission, of course, um, the commitment of member states, uh, international projects, not only European, and we have an advisory board. Um, yes, this is, um, I think, um, the main um, thing of to, to, to explain. 
currently, I repeat it again, we work on uh, nanomaterials. Next slide, please. Once more, the aims of the Malta Initiative. We want to strengthen the trust in sustainable innovation and enforceable legislation. And clear and enforceable legislation is needed because it is one of the key factors of long-term investments of industry. So this is the reason why we say we support sustainable, safe and sustainable innovation. International standards help to come to overcome trade barriers. And this is also our aim by doing so. EU funded research projects strengthen the international cooperation of experts from research industry and regulation. And we would like to make the Malta Initiative more sustainable, but um, we can only um, work on it. And uh, what we can do, I come, uh, I have another slide a little bit later. The starting point was the adoption of test guidelines and in short term, there were calls and you are talking about the calls in this two days uh, within the EU funding program for research and innovation. And uh, the long term, I'm convinced we need is a EU test met method strategy, which is solid funded and I think by the commission. But this is uh, my personal thinking and I come back later to this point. Next slide, please. The achievement of the Malta Initiative. I think we achieved a spotlight to the importance of internationally harmonized tools and their adoption to technical progress. I think in the last five years, a lot of people talk about this, and I hope there are consequences of these discussions. I hope so. Um, as I already told you in Malta, um, Mr. Dröll, the, the director of the DGRTD, um, was um, convinced to give some money and um, there were courts initiative under the EU research program, but to be really precise, the decision that these courts um, were made is the program committee of the DGRTD. It's not the Malta initiative, it's the program committee uh, of the GGRTD uh, was in this program committee. They're sitting the member states and they vote for the courts. Um, therefore, I say we initiated that. And we supported the development or the adoption of more than um, 20 OECD test guidelines. We were supporting it because work, I repeat again, you know it better, a lot of you are sitting here uh, in front of your PC, the work is really done by the experts within the courts, within the research projects, and I appreciate really, really much this um, impressive work. I'm always impressed, and I think this is uh, really, really important work. And I think, and therefore I made these little points because you can also um, say what the Malta Initiative achieved. But I, I think one more point, and I didn't mention it, but I think it's good to, to, for, to, to, um, to write it uh, later. The better understanding between the research projects as such, regulatory needs of research, and the OECD rules, uh, which Ma mentioned just before. I think this is also achievement of the Malta Initiative. And we have some uh, YouTube videos which were made in Nano Harmony. You all know them, I hope so. But this is really an achievement of this network. Next slide, please. These possible steps are 
um, ideas I personally wrote down. This is not, um, this um, proposals are not discussed with the Malta Initiative uh, Advisory Board, some yes, some not. But I would like to, to mention them here because, um, yes, perhaps some of you can pick up these ideas. Um, we need a website to be more visible. And um, we just got the allowance to make a, a website out of the, the website of my ministry. So, and we made a contract and hopefully at the beginning in, of next year, January, February, we start with this website and then we send the link around. We wrote a position paper. The position paper is ready. And uh, I can share this position paper with you if you're interested in, but this position paper has to be signed by high ranked people um, of a lot of organization to, to become into um, practical work. But on the other hand, um, I think the ideas in this position papers are um, interesting enough that we can share it with you. Now, the next point is, um, I think, a center of uh, the sustainability of the multi initiative, the campaigning for more financial support. Um, I have no solution for this, and um, perhaps you can support the multi initiative in this way. Presentation on conferences is important, therefore, I'm here. Perhaps also scientific article in journals or new newspapers can help us to bring the complex to a more political level. I don't know. And there are also points. There are more possible next steps and we will discuss this, discuss the steps in the next multi-initiative board meeting in January. Next slide, please. These are my conclusions. We need safety research for sustainable innovation that is in line with legal requirements. The OECD test guidelines make research results comparable and reprodu reproducible. Therefore, it's really important to work there. The Malta Initiative is one example. It's not the only one. It's one example how to bring stakeholders together. And I'm convinced that only international cooperation leads to sustainable success. The work on OECD test guidelines and the work on other standards needs a systematic approach underpinned with financial solutions. And therefore, I'm convinced that we need a long-term and adequately funded EU test method strategy for our, I say, um, European legislation. Of course, we need it also internationally, but I'm here as a European and uh, we focus on uh, financial in Europe. So we need this mainly in Europe. So I come to the end and I'm happy to take questions, Ma. Thank you so much, Anke. And again, uh, thank you so much for, for uh, triggering the Malta Initiative, which is, uh, I don't know if it's a fun number, but now it's definitely one that, uh, that we all uh, recognize. And as Anke said, I mean, we, we, uh, this has been starting uh, in the nanomaterials field, but when you see uh, the main principles and the, what it's advocating for is really for uh, test guidelines for all chemicals. It's about consensus, it's about standardization, it's about um, having methodologies that are reliable and that we can exchange uh, the results uh, with anyone around uh, the globe. So, so this is something that is quite important. I also take... Um, I, I, I now that I'm, I was seeing your um, your slide about the the ideas for the next steps, I think we heard 
just before you easeled and the excitement that uh, it caused to have all these research ongoing and everything that they are uh, advancing, uh, the science that how it's advancing. And, and now the next step that you mentioned about uh, NAMS and, and how we can accommodate all the work that needs to be done, that still need to be done for nanomaterials and how we can start moving to uh, the the risk assessment, how it's moving and evolving, and how to make this sustainable. So quite important. Uh, financial support, of course. I mean, we heard uh, the, the Malta initiative, we heard how it has triggered several calls, several projects. We have heard Nano Harmony, and we will be hearing also in January uh, about uh, Risk Gone, uh, Go for Nano. Uh, Nano Rigo that have also been uh, supporting this and, and, and thanks to this uh, big trigger from the Malta initiative. And I was just thinking about now that you said, I mean, we, we do need, and, and I agree with you with the statement that we need to have um, very complex ideas translated for policymakers. And, and I think this is something that is key and for uh, where, where we do need researchers uh, to help us to, to explain how this is important, how this is going to reduce animal testing, how this is going to reduce cost of testing, et cetera, just to put it in the agenda and to make it uh, relevant and, and worthwhile funding. I think us, that we are more involved with you on the technical work, we understand this perfectly, but you need to, to translate that uh, to those that will be deciding the funding uh, of the coming calls or uh, the your research institutes, whatever you're coming from. So, so I think that's uh, and and just uh, just to convey the message that Anke mentioned, there is uh, you mentioned a paper, a position paper. So if you are interested in 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 um, in seeing the paper, please reach out to Anke or uh, reach out to, to any of us uh, on the meeting and we can just put you in contact. And uh, and if I understood, you are looking for sign uh, signatures. So this is to support uh, further research, further test guidelines. I mean, the research that is going to, the regulatory research that is going to support test guidelines. Uh, so please uh, just uh, contact us. I don't see any question in the chat. Uh, Okay, so I have a question. Will advanced materials need their own Malta initiative or are we thinking more about the Malta initiative that was done for nano that now is more on chemicals and, and it's about test guidelines, right, Tanke? So I don't know what, what did your opinion is about uh, the can, question. Can you repeat the question? The question is uh, that uh, we also include advanced materials. So will advanced materials need their own Malta initiative? Uh, I have no answer for this. <laughs> but perhaps something that we can uh, discuss this after and Sean, uh, when we have the session on advanced materials, this is something, I mean, I think that the example of the Malta uh, for for me, from the OECD point of view, we have a before and after the Malta initiative in terms of uh, test guidelines development. So something to consider and something to learn from. Okay, so I don't see any more questions. Thank you so much, Anke, for, for once again advocating uh, for the work and the importance work on test island. This is much appreciated uh, in my other hat that is uh, in my, my background. Uh, thank you so much, and, and please uh, do not hesitate to contact Anke if you want to see this position paper. Thank you so much, Anke. And with this, I think we're going to turn over. We have two more presentations before we break for, for a, a quick lunch break. Uh, so we will turn into Elizabeth Yunisht, who's going to present uh, what is going on on task guidelines and, and GDs. You, Elizabeth, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mark. So yes, welcome to my talk. <clears throat> Sorry. In this case, about uh, two different documents I want to present here. One is a status report coming from Nano Harmony and NanoMed, and the other one is a standardization roadmap from Gap for Nano. Um, can you? Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. That's fine. Yeah. So um, as said, um, my name is Elizabeth Heunisch. I'm working for the Federal Institute for Occupational Safety and Health in Germany and I'm co-leading NanoHarmony. So uh, next slide, please. So the first um, document I'm going to present 
is a status report from NanoHarmony and NanoMed about the development or revisions of OECD test guidelines and guidance documents applicable for nanomaterials. And this report was um, combined and written together with Fleming Cassé and Eric Blaker from RIVM, Thomas Kubus and myself and Mar Gonzalez from the OECD. So next slide, please. So the idea of this status report is to have easy accessible information on the state of, of the developments of OECD test guidelines and guidance documents from nanomaterials. With this, we can keep all stakeholders up to date on a easy level and is of course a living document. So that needs to be updated regularly to be of any relevance. So it's just a status from July of this year. Um, it contains test guidelines and guidance documents that were already adapted or developed for the testing of nanomaterials and ongoing projects at OECD, WNT and WPMN. And we also included examples of standardization activities aiming at OECD. Next, please. And the status report is both accessible. Can you go back, please? Um, on the web page of NanoHarmony and of NanoMed. So now the next one, sorry. <laughs> so how is it um, built up? So we having an overview of the different projects or already finished documents within a table where you can see well, the title of the document or the project, the ID, where is it linked to? Either it's a t the test guideline number or the number of the, the project. And we have a link to this description in the report and the whole tables are sorted by the sections of the OECD. So it's section one for physical chemical properties, for example, section two for effects of biotic systems and so on. And if we look into the details of the different uh, descriptions, next slide, please. We have in here, again, the title of the project or the document we're describing. Then again, the ID and the year where we expect the project to be finished or where the document was finished, who is leading both um, the institute and the country who is leading at OECD and um, the section or the category where the development is taking place. And then having a short description of the project, what it is about and on the recent progress and outlook. Next slide, please. So to giving an overview, that report contains 12 OECD documents that were finished in the different sections. I'm not going into and all of them. So the newest in this list are uh, the TG124 and 125 on the specific surface area and the particle size and size distribution of nanomaterials and in the health section the study report and preliminary guidance on the adaption of in vitro mammalia cell-based genotoxicity. Um, next slide, please. We're having 15 ongoing OECD projects within uh, this report. Um, you can see the list here. Many of them are also supported by NanoHarmony or gaf for nano or other EU projects or then national projects. Uh, next slide, please. And those are example of 10 examples of standardization activities that are aiming at OECD. So we're also looking at what might come up. As said before, there, th those are all only examples. And you can also um, well, get in contact with us on, on your ideas, what you want to bring forward, and we can include it in the next status report then. So next slide, please. So that was already the overview of the first document. The second document I want to um, present here is a deliverable coming from gaf for nano We already heard yesterday about gaf for nano in the context of test guideline developments. Here it's about a standardization roadmap that was developed mainly by JRC, Kirsten Rasmussen, but also by contributions from Bauer, BNN, Timalsol, TNO, Inaris, RIVM, Aeri and Cephic. So next slide, please. So the standardization roadmap was developed in Gaffa Nano Work Package 6, which is about building a stakeholder framework 
for risk governance of nanomaterials. So gaf for nano is one of the projects that is looking into risk governance for nanomaterials. We already heard about the sister project risk gun this morning and there's the third sister project called um, NanoRigo. Um, within this work package six, there's a task 6.4 about aligning risk governance with global efforts for standardization and harmonization of methods. Uh, within this task, there is already the deliverable 6.9, which is a risk governance standards baseline report. Within this report, there's an overview of available relevant standards. They come from organizations like CEN, ISO, and OECD. Most of the, those standards are in the direction of identification of nanomaterials and their toxicological and ecotoxicological effects. Um, and now built on this, there is now the standards roadmap to deliver with 6.10, which identifies additional subjects that need standardiz uh, standardization. And th this leading also to a roadmap for standardization. Next slide, please. So looking at what is relevant in terms of standardization for risk governance, all the four different pillars are relevant for standardization and the four different pillars that were developed um, in view of risk governance for nanomaterials are pre-assessment, appraisal, characterization and evaluation, then risk management, cross-cutting aspects and risk-based legislation and policy. Looking into each of these pillars, next slide please. We can see within pre-assessment appraisal, characterization and evaluation, we're having data and data quality. We have methods for characterization and ecotox and tox properties, exposure data and assessment and risk assessment and risk evaluation methods. Next slide. Within the second pillar, there's the risk management that includes risk management, risk reduction, monitoring and review, information transfer along the R&I and &I in general value chain, and risk transfer, liability, and certification. Next, please. Within the third pillar, there's then the cross-cutting aspects that includes risk communication, risk perception, and other aspects. And the last one, please. Is the fourth pillar, which is risk-based legislation and policies. And there are no standards within this field, but all the other standards within the other pillars, they feed into and support the policies and the legislation. Next slide, please. So <clears throat> within all those different fields, there are different topics um, identified. So within the needs for standardization and harmonization, for in this example, uh, FISCAM properties, there is the topic of instrument and methods, dispersion, physical chemical characterization, and so on. So that is just part of the table for the FISCAM properties. And then within these topics, we have the different needs for the standardization and harmonization. So this deliverable contains 11 of those tables where different topics were identified and their needs for standardization and harmonization. So there's a long list of different needs actually. Next slide, please. And all those different needs and uh, well, needs that were identified here, we can see now here in a kind of a heat map, how we can, those can be tackled in the view of the authors of this deliverable. So it is um, well sorted into limited ongoing actions, moderate and intense ongoing actions, and either to be foreseen on a more like present short term or medium term or long term activity needed to strengthen the risk governance legislation and policies. Next slide, please. So the idea is with those two different documents combined and together we have one document that gives an overview of the current development and needs. So that's both the status report, but also the deliverable 6.9 from um, Gaf Farnani that, that gives an overview of standards and um, test guidelines that are already there. And then combined 
with the standardization roadmap, that is a good basis for future activities and for also the priority setting on harmonization and standardization activities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Uh, and I think we have a question from Elise Morel on, on the chat about, uh, we were, uh, I think she posted this when, um, when we were, um, you were presenting the first document. So it says uh, who will be in charge of updating the status report and how frequently the later document will be updated. So I guess for now the authors that the, the first report should feel some responsible of um, doing an update. So probably we're thinking about a timeline of uh, two years. Do you Thank agree, you. Mark? Yes, no, I think, I think this is fine. And I think it's part of our responsibility also within the OECD to, to keep this update. I mean, we do have a um, schedule of activities and a program of work public. Uh, but it's not as a focus on nanomaterials. It's about the whole uh, program on test guidelines. So, but but yes, I mean I think and but at, in any case, I think the idea is also if we see that there is uh, additional information that should be conveyed, we will be make it available. This is something that we have learned uh, in our exchange with Nano Harmony, which is. Uh, make as much uh, data publicly accessible and, and to make it a little bit more accessible for those that are not normally involved in the work of the OECD. Okay, then I have a question, but that's a more technical question. And I don't know if the, the leads of that is about what should be decided if a substance is clearly identified as a nanomaterials according to OECD 125, which is the particle size and size distribution. Um, okay, no, it's it's quite technical, so I don't think this is going to be able to, you're going to be able to respond this one. I think it's more uh, a question for the leads of uh, VSSA, and I don't know if uh, one of the leads is on the line, otherwise, um, Frederick, if you allow us, I think what we're going to be doing is to, to retrieve your question and contact the, the leads and perhaps uh, post an answer if it's uh, simple enough uh, in the chat uh, later today, if that's, uh, this, if that's agreeable to you. Maybe the JRC, someone from the JRC can answer on that question. Yeah. I'm, I'm looking to see, I don't want to put anyone on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> But if anyone from the GRC uh, involved in this uh, in the in the development of this task guideline is is around, please uh, raise your hand. Otherwise, I think we can just uh, forward the questions to them by email and then uh, get back to you, Frederick, if that's okay. Okay, I don't see. Do I see any other questions? We will get back to you, Frederick. Thank you so much for the question. Uh, and, and just for information, there will be uh, some webinars coming up uh, next year. Uh, the first one is going to be on the 7th of February to present uh, the test guideline 125. And we're still finding a date for, for this uh, test guideline. Uh, okay, and I see that Juan Riego, who's uh, um, who's responding from the GRC, uh, that uh, we have to send the question to DG Environment, and and we will do so, uh, Frederick. So please, just uh, we have your contact details, and we will get back to you on that. Thank you so much, uh, Elizabeth. I think there are no more questions. So with that, I think we it's time for our uh, last uh, speaker who, jo who joined is uh, Richard Handy. Richard, welcome, welcome to the, to the meeting and thank you so much for agreeing to present uh, the research that you're working on, on uh, experimental data on digestibility, assays and preliminary data from earworm studies on titanium dioxide. So if I can just uh, give you the floor, uh, feel free to share your screen. And if you can just uh, share your oh, your camera. Thank you so much. Welcome. Can, can you hear me? We can hear you. OK, okay good, good. And we can see uh, you. Now good, good. Yeah. Let me share my screen. Um... <clears throat> OK. 
update of some of the work in uh, task 1.2 on the uh, Nano Harmony project, where we're looking at uh, bioaccumulation testing of nanomaterials. And, and in particular, um, I'm going to show you some data on the gap filling experiments, the new experiments we've done re recently on earthworms and, and digestibility assays. And uh, I, I guess the background to this is, of course, that we know that uh, Bioaccumulation testing is part of the bigger picture of risk assessment. We need to look at persistence, toxicity, and bioaccumulation, and it's the it's the latter one, bioaccumulation, that we we've done less work on uh, with nanomaterials generally. And uh, so the focus of my talk is going to be on on bioaccumulation potential and the alternatives that we're using. Now, uh, for those that are not familiar with this area of testing, the traditional approach is to do a fish bioaccumulation test over about four weeks. And in the OECD, we use TG305 uh, to do that test. And there are two methods available, uh, one where you do the exposure via the water, another method where you do the exposure via the food. Uh, but in either case, you try and measure the uptake in the organism to steady state. Uh, where you can then calculate the, the concentration factors. With an aqueous exposure, we tend to calculate the, the BCF, bioconcentration factor. With a dietary exposure, we calculate BMF, biomagnification factor. And then, of course, that goes on to be used in risk assessment. Now, the traditional trigger for this test is the octanol water partition coefficient uh, um, or KOW test. Um, and this was originally devised for organic chemicals, of course, where there's a clear relationship between the lipid solubility of the compound and uh, the bioaccumulation factor. And there are some problems with that concept for nanomaterials. And uh, we know already that the, the log KOW test doesn't work very well for nanomaterials. And so we need to find another trigger in this scheme of work. Um, we also have assumptions about solute chemistry that don't apply to nano, uh, but under the current regulations um, in many parts of the world, if the bioaccumulation test itself um, is needing to be done uh, and the trigger isn't working, then you have to proceed directly to the, the fish test. And there are, there are two basic problems with that. One is we, we could end up testing lots of materials unnecessarily, uh, and it could be a an expensive and unrealistic workload. And there are also some animal welfare aspects here. You know, going straight to an in vivo fish test, uh, we're not really considering alternatives in our, our testing schemes, and we'd like to change that. Uh, so in 2018, we made a proposal, uh, which we published in the scientific paper, um, outlining how we could use the, um, um, the, the fish dietary version of the TG305 type test uh, for assessing only a select few nanomaterials and doing that as a last resort after we'd screened out other materials based on some new chemical triggers relating to nanomaterial behavior and data from invertebrates and in vitro studies from fish. I'm not going to go into the detail here because I'm going to show you some of that in a moment, but do look at that original paper. Uh, and in terms of sort of progress on, on this task, where we're aiming is to provide the OECD with a scoping review on the possible tools and techniques that could be used in a tiered approach to testing for bioaccumulation so that we minimize the workload and, and the number of animals used. Uh, and we're progressing with that. We've published two papers recently that give a meta-analysis of data to show how this tiered scheme might work. And I'm going to show you some of that data in a second. Uh, and also, uh, we've been collecting more data to show this working with more diverse nanomaterials. And at the moment, we, we have a draft of the scoping through with the expert group at the uh, OECD. It's currently with ECHA to, to get some feedback from them on the, on the latest draft. And then we'll be going back to the OECD, hopefully with a new draft. Um, but um, we, we've been, you know, thinking about this iteratively. So this is a kind of, you know, a living document. And uh, last year we, we published a, an update of this uh, idea that it also included using the earthworm bioaccumulation test, um, because in a meta-analysis that we've done, we're able to show that the, the earthworm data um, seems to map quite well onto the fish data, which raises you know, the issue, why don't we do the earthworm test or, or something like it instead of a fish test? 
And, and the sorts of approach we were using with that data were to um, collect data on nanomaterials in earthworms, plot that data out. And here you can see some graphs of different nanomaterials where we plotted them out. They're coming to steady state that you can see. And we're experimentally calculating the bioaccumulation factors in the earthworms for the nanomaterials and, and the uh, metal salts. This is an example for some copper-based nanomaterials, but we've done it for, for four or five other materials. And, um, and, and once we've got these accumulation curves, then uh, we, we go on to, to ask that question, you know, do the bioaccumulation factors in earthworms correlate with the biomagnification factors we've been doing in vivo in fish? And here's some data on copper and silver materials that we've grouped because their chemistries are similar. Uh, and you can see that they're, they're correlating fairly well. We, again, we've done that with other nanomaterials too. So we, we're, we're thinking that the earthworm test is is looking very promising as an alternative to the uh, fish bioaccumulation test for for nanomaterials. And um, um, but one of the materials that we we haven't looked at in the earthworm that we'd like to to look at to complete our data set with all the other tests that we've done is titanium dioxide. Uh, and so we, we we've done a a pilot study where um, we took some earthworms and we exposed them to the P25. Uh, you know, original Degasso nanomaterial, um, just to do some range finding on on seeing how earthworms take up titanium, and part part of the reason for doing that was um, not understanding how different species take up titanium, but also because of the reasonably high background of titanium in some soils around the world. So you know, it's it's something that's already there. Um, so we did this pilot study, a range finder going um, from sort of zero up to 5,000 milligrams of titanium per kilogram of soil. And what we were able to identify that once we got much over 1,000 milligrams per kilogram, we could detect quite readily the, the concentration in the uh, worms above the background. And we, we focused on two species here, uh, an Enchytraeid worm, Enchytraeus uh, crypticus, and also the sort of common earth worm. Senior fat eater, um, which you're probably more familiar with. Um, but nonetheless, we were able to identify a, a, a range finding dose. And so we went on to some main bioaccumulation studies with the earthworm uh, and, and the Enchytraeid worms, where we were basically following TG317 and doing exposure with 4,000 milligrams of TiO2 per kilogram of soil. And basically, we, we spiked the soil with the test material followed it for 14 days in the Enchytraeids and 21 days in the earthworms. Um, and then after that time period, put them back into clean soil to measure the elimination phase. And throughout, we're taking samples for metal analysis and, and various other things. And we, we've tried a range of materials in here, um, some nanomaterials that we, we looked at extensively in the EU Nanosolutions project, uh, the P25 material again, a bulk material from Akros as a point of reference, and, and an annotated material because we're interested, of course, in the, the crystal structure effect with some of these TiO2s. Well, uh, the experiment's still running, but but we've got the the uptake phase data sort of kind of roughly plotted out just to give you a feel for how that's going. Um, this is the uh, titanium accumulation in the earthworms during the uptake phase over 21 days. And in all of these plots, the, um, the black circles are the controls or the background levels in the worms. And you can see there's a bit of background noise in the animals, but we're, we're readily detecting the titanium ab above that. Um, we haven't processed all the data yet to work out uptake and elimination rates because the experiment's still running. But um, and thanks to colleagues at uh, UKCEH for, for, for doing the, uh, the experiment itself. We've been analysing the samples at Plymouth. Um, but that's in progress. And we, we've also finished the uptake phase for the Enchytraeid worms. And here you can see um, the, the, the blue circles are the control animals and the grey circles are the exposed. And what we're seeing is quite a rapid increase in titanium early on. Um, and then it's decreasing slightly, but still staying above the background. Um, so it's a dynamic process. There are some things going on there that we need to look at in more detail. But, but nonetheless, those, those uptake studies and clearance studies are uh, in progress. Uh, the other thing that we've been doing that we've uh, uh, been progressing on still 
is um, some of the in vitro alternatives to fish, which will be tier three in our, our scheme. We've been looking at two things, a digestibility assay that simulates the bioaccessible fraction in the gut lumen of a fish. Uh, and that seems to be working quite well. We've, we've tested quite a few nanomaterials with that um, and we're, we'd like to collect more data. Um, and we've also been using a gut sac preparation, which I'll show you in a second, that allows us to measure the, um, the initial uptake rate into the intestinal tissue. So um, that gives us bioavailability. So we've got bioaccessibility and bioavailability from these measurements and that might be predictive of bioaccumulation. But, but what I will do is also draw your attention to, to fish cell lines. Although we haven't been doing that in nanoharmony per se, um, the, the test guideline on fish cell lines has, has just come out and we're thinking that you know there might be an opportunity to also adapt that for bioaccumulation testing. Uh, so, so you know, watch this space. Um, but anyway, I'm going to show you some data on the digestibility assay, some new data on, on serum oxides, uh, and then say a bit about the gut sac stuff with serum oxide. Um, we've published the methodology for this in, in, in quite a bit of detail um, in a paper in 2018. It's basically a, a serial extraction uh, that you can do using salt solutions, EDTA, acid, and then an enzyme digestion to, to get bioaccessible fractions. And here's some data showing that for silver. Um, but what we've done in, in NanoHarmony is to try and focus that methodology down to a quick decision tool so we can get a yes, no answer on, on the bio uh, accessibility. Um, we, we focused on doing this assay at pH 2 to represent the stomach compartment and pH 7.8 to represent the, um, the, the intestine of a, a fish. And here's some new data on cerium oxide. And uh, I guess the take home message from this is that, you know, as you'd expect, as we increase the incubation time from one to four hours, we, we get more release of the material from the, the food pellets. And, uh, and there is a pH effect. You, you, you tend to get uh, more release in the acidic conditions in the stomach than, than, than in the intestine. Um, but if I was to give you the kind of take home message from this data set, we're able to get a, um, a, a release order for the digestibility or the bioaccessibility of these materials, where of course the control is the lowest, um, then the cerium oxide nanoparticles and, and then the cerium salts. Um, so that the metal salt is more bioavailable, more bioaccessible in the gut lumen. Um, we then went on to repeat this with gut sacs, and here's the gut sac method. Basically, you take the intestine out of the fish, um, um, the whole gut out of the fish, and then you make small gut sacs from each region of the uh, gut, um, and, uh, and, and then you incubate it with your test material, in this case, cerium oxide uh, materials for, for four hours, and then measure the, the metal concentrations in the mucosa and the muscularis of the preparation. Um, it's, it's a method that's been around for many years, uh, and, and we've used it in research for a long time. But, but anyway, um, here's some data uh, that Nathaniel Clark and others at Plymouth collected on cerium oxide nanomaterials. And what you can see is that we uh, can measure the uptake in the stomach and the intestines and the esophagus and so on. So in different regions of the gut uh, and also in different layers of the gut. So we can measure uptake in the mucosa and in the underlying muscularis. And the muscularis is especially uh, interesting because it represents stuff that's transferred from the gut lumen to the blood side of the animal. So anything in the muscularis would you know, you might consider that to be be bioaccumulation, if you like, um, and uh, and so we're interested in in how that's working. I guess some some take home messages from the detail in all of that data. Um, the bioaccessibility is in the order of the cerium oxide nanoparticles generally being less bioaccessible in the gut lumen than the metal salt. Uh, but that changes a bit when we get to the gut sacs. Um, and although we can measure cerium in all the regions of the gut sacs, overall, um, you know, within the nanomaterials, the cerium, the uncoated cerium oxide has more bio, bioavailability than the coated materials. And in general, the, the cerium oxides are not that much different to the metal salt once you're, you're into the intestinal tissue. And, um, uh, and, and when we look at the muscularis, we, we see a kind of similar thing, um, except there, there, there's more uptake in the, in the mid-intestine region, which of 
is where metals are taken up in fish. But the main message is we do see a coating effect. Uh, in this example, the coatings are less bioavailable than the uncoated material. Um, and that's quite interesting because some of the other materials we've tested, uh, that's the other way around where the coatings tend to be a bit more bioaccessible. Um, so it seems to be material dependent. And in this case, um, you know, once we get into the intestine itself, there isn't much difference between the metal salt and, and, and nano compared to the digestibility assay. And again, that's um, quite different to some of the other things that we've tested. So for with the copper materials, the metal salt was much more bioavailable. Um, so again, material specific. Anyway, to kind of o overview all the things that we've been doing in the Nano Harmony project, and um, you know, we, we've characterised all our materials. We, we, where we've decided to do earthworm experiments, they, they've been done or they're in progress. The digestibility assays have been done. We've now finished the zinc oxide in Plymouth as well. All the gut sack is done, and we've got data on TG305 as well, um, with some of that data coming from uh, other labs in the project. Um, but um, so, so what we're trying to achieve here is a, a, a good data set from a range of different nanomaterials with different behaviours that can support this guidance document of the OECD. And I think we've, we've probably tested more nanomaterials and other guidance documents in that regard, but, but um, you know, we're, we're trying to show the evidence base for a, a tiered approach to testing and, and show the utility of the tools that, that might be available. Uh, so just to give you some quick conclusions, I hope I've shown you that the earthworm test so far is shown to be a good predictor of the fish bioaccumulation test. Uh, so why aren't we doing earthworms instead? Um, but all of these approaches have some utility for nanomaterials. You know, we're hoping to use the earthworm test, the digestibility assay, the various in vitro fish methods as a decision tool to help decide whether or not we need to do an in vivo fish test. Um, and we've kind of put all that into the scoping review that's gone to the OECD to show how uh, these techniques will work and how they could be used. Um, so I think we're in a good position in terms of developing a tiered approach to testing and reducing the um, animal use in the testing scheme and, and enabling some of the three R's. I know we're, we're at the revision stage with that scoping review. I think uh, colleagues at ECRA have been kindly looking at another draft of it and we'll be back to the, the wider working party with it soon, Hope I hope. Um, so, so that's it, folks. I'll, I'll stop there and take any questions if you've got them. Thank you very much, Richard. As always, a, a really nice uh, presentation on, on, the, on the huge amount of work that you're, you are uh, leading. Uh, I don't see questions, but I would like to just... Uh, okay, yes. So we have a, an oral question from uh, Manuel Gassituco the, from Chile. Uh, Manuel, please uh, take the floor. Yeah, thank you for the nice presentation. I just have a simple question. Is, do you think that your data can be transformed to another magnitude for the nanoparticle instead of mass. Will you will you be able to transfer transform it somehow in a, a number of particles or surface area in order to see uh, the the effect of these magnitudes yep. on your results? <laughs> yeah. Yes, we did. Um... In the two papers we published, one at the end of 2021 and the beginning of 2022, part of the meta-analysis looked at the issue of particle metrics. And what we were able to do was to come up with some prediction equations that use particle metrics. And, and we managed to simplify it down to um, some of the metal chemistry. So it was to do with the ionic radius and charge density of the metal ions inside the nanomaterial the hydrodynamic diameter and the particle size, primary particle size. Um, so we do have in those papers some simple prediction equations that considers those particle metrics. And I guess in the wider picture here, you know, if we can come up with equations like that, um, we can then start thinking about safe by design. So if we know what the factors are in the bioaccumulation, you know, can we take those factors out when we design the materials in the first place? Um, so, so we're just kind of beginning on that road, really. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Richard. Uh, we have another question from Alberto Bianco. Alberto, please take the floor. Yeah, thank you. Um, I have a question about the, the, the uh, coated and non-coated uh, serum nanoparticles because the, the non-coated, I'm wondering, you, you need to, to have a stabilizer 
uh, uh, surfactant to, 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 to make them uh, colloidally stable. So yeah. you may have effects. So can you comment a little bit more on this? Yeah, so re remember here that we're, we're putting the, the nanomaterials into the fish food. So it's, so it's inside the food pellet when we make it. And, um, ah. and, and so when it gets digested in the, in the simulated gut lumen, we're looking at that behavior amongst all the colloids that might also be released from the food itself. Now, of course, in the, in the real gut, there are some factants and other things in there. So, I mean, that would be interesting to look at that too, but, but um, certainly when we're dosing the pellets and making the foods, if we have a dispersion issue with getting even dosing into the food pellets, we, we might use a detergent or a surfactant. We didn't in the case of the cerium, but for example, with carbon nanotubes, we needed to use Triton X100 to, to, to get them to disperse a bit more easily. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Richard. And we have a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, one is, uh, reads, I assume the earthworm bioaccumulation protocol is OECD 317. Is there a specific protocol for nanomaterials? Um, not really. We, um, we, we've we looked at various sort of OECD tests with earthworms and um, all of the ones that, you know, the toxicity tests and the bioaccumulation tests, and um, and they seem to work more or less as is for, for the nanomaterials with, with very little modification. So unlike some of the other tests, we we don't need to kind of pull it apart and rebuild it to get it to work well for nano. So so that's a, a quite nice advantage of the earthworm test that it, you know, we, we don't have to reinvent it to make it to work with nano. Thank you, Richard. And uh, I see one last question from Eric Bleeker, which reads, substances with bioaccumulation concerns are often organic substances. Mm -hmm. Your work so far uh, focuses on metal, metal oxides. Do you see major concerns in translating these approaches to carbon-based nanomaterials? Um, the, the, the short answer is no. I don't see, see the a fundamental problem with applying this approach to the organic-based materials. We, we, we've tried to do some of these things with carbon nanotubes and C60 and so on. The, the real issue is the in vivo fish test and having measurement methods in the tissue. Um, most studies have been done using carbon-14 labeled nanomaterials or some other approach like that, some kind of label. Um, and, and so the, the barrier to kind of rolling this out more widely is a technical barrier on measurement in, in tissue. Um, we're trying to solve that. And uh, Elijah Peterson, I think, has, has got a paper coming out on this topic very, uh, I think it came out last week, actually. Um, so, so just been a new paper out discussing this very problem, um, but I think we can solve it. Thank you, Richard. And we got a, another question. Uh, so, and, and I think it's an interesting question regard, uh, based on the, on the, the background and the, the expertise that we have around the table, which reads, uh, what is the interest for you as an academic researcher to produce a scoping document compared to a more classical scientific paper? Ah, oh, okay. It's a very philosophical <laughs> question. Um, <laughs> So uh, I, I guess from my side in academia, uh, I, my, my research spans very fundamental mechanistic stuff right through to, to stuff where I'm interested in protecting the environment. So, um, yeah, that translation of the academic research into regulation is important. Um, you know, if we look at our funding in the EU and certainly in the UK from NERC, they, they really want us to, to do science that makes a difference to the to the environment and um, you know having something that amends the regulation and improves the safety to the environment is, is one way of doing that so um, yeah it's about you know making sure our science has got utility and um, and I guess one of my pleas as a journal editor to all you scientists out there is make sure you put the really important method information in your paper because otherwise we can't use it for these kind of regulatory type risk assessments. Um, so, you know, we've got our homework to do in academia as well to, to make sure we, we get all that key information out there in our papers. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Richard. And I think, I mean, yeah, I mean, you, you have always been uh, very academic. And at the same time, I mean, I think I've, I've been working with you on regulatory science for, for quite a bit of time. So that's, uh, that's um, 
reassuring that we we count uh, with the research the, the right research uh, for our work thank you so much so so <laughs> Thanks, i think everyone. we are done with the questions okay and we have a, another statement from juan who says that we need more people translating research into something directly applicable for protecting people and environment and making a difference for society so so i think this is uh, yes i mean this is we agree with uh, with that statement so for the next, uh, thank you so much, uh, Richard, for, for joining us today. So I think okay. our, all of speakers this morning have been extremely uh, well behaved and they have all uh, kept under the, the right amount of timing. So they have offered us uh, 10 more minutes uh, for a lunch break. So if I can ask you, uh, we're going to restart at uh, 1.30 Central European time. That means 40 minutes uh, from now for those that are not... Uh, uh, in the same um, in the same time. So please, if you can just come back 35 minutes from now, so we can uh, make sure that everybody is uh, connected, that the sound is checked, and that we can start sharp at 1.30. We have a busy agenda this afternoon on advanced materials. So please just stay online, just stay connected. Just uh, You can just put your mute button and uh, go and, and, and take something for lunch. And we wait for you uh, at uh, 1.30 Central European time. Thank you so much. <laughs>